can I just get right into where God's taking us today? Is that all right? So take your Bibles. Some of y'all are saying, well, just get right into it. I mean, it's kind of late, Pastor Mark. Well, that's all right. We're going to get you out of here in time to get a ham sandwich about 6 o'clock this evening. <laughs> take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And then Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. There were less woo-woos because y'all realize we got a lot of ground to cover today. But as you're turning there, I want you to look at your neighbor and remind them of this series title. God did it. Look at somebody else and say, God did it. Look at somebody else and say, God did it. Oh, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God did it. I need somebody. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Look at your neighbor and say, God did it. He gave to us his best. His name is Jesus. He was born of a virgin. He was placed in a manger. He grew up and got out of the manger, Mike. He lived a blameless life for 33 and a half years, and then they crucified him because of love. But on the third day, God did it. I need you to begin to believe God's going to do it. Look at your neighbor and say, God did it. How did you get here? God did it. How did you get over that? God did it. How did you figure it out? God did it. How did you break that addiction? God did it. How did those kids get saved? God did it. Shoo. Somebody say, shoo. Where am I going? I'm going to the book of Matthew. The gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew is, we've been in the gospel of John. We're jumping out of the gospel of John and we're going to the gospel of Matthew because Matthew introduces Christ to the world in a little different way. I think I'm gonna let you be seated. Is that, is that, is that all right? Yeah. A lot of people get excited about getting, being seated up in this place. But I'm going to take you to Matthew's gospel who introduces Christ to the world in a different way than John does. But to be completely transparent, honest with you, preaching the Christmas story, I don't really like it. Some of y'all would say, well, hold on a second. He's a pastor. He doesn't like preaching the Christmas story. It's not that I don't like it. It's, that it's, it's a difficult story to preach. Why? Because we all know the Christmas story. And sometimes you have your version of the Christmas story in your head, and sometimes your version is not necessarily correct. And so I'm like, God, you know, it's really tough at Christmas time to, to find some nuance that maybe you've never heard or seen in the Christmas story. And then God convicted me, and he said, listen, yes, the story does not change, but how you perceive the story does. Because if your faith is here and your faith grows, then when your faith grows, you'll begin to see different nuances in the story. You know what I'm saying? So the story is the same, but I'm not the same. Hello? Okay, hello? And so today I want to show you a different nuance in the story, maybe something you never thought about. It's a different kind of Christ Christmas message. Is that all right? So Matthew's gospel is written really to a Jewish crowd. This Jewish crowd has been waiting on the coming Messiah for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, really thousands of years, and they've been waiting on him come and he's supposed to come to the through the line of David and so here is Matthew writing this gospel and he introduces us to Christ in a way that's very unique because all the gospels have to write the story about Jesus knowing that the reader does not have the vantage point of the eyewitness account so what they're writing has to stand the test of time and so Matthew introduces Jesus to us through one of the most exciting passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. It's the genealogy of Christ. Can I read some to you? This is the genealogy. Somebody say, this is the genealogy of Jesus. 
the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, right out of the gate, the first thing that comes out of Matthew's pen is this is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. This, the Jewish culture would realize, hold on a second. He's grabbed our attention. Remember, many who read this will not have had that that eyewitness account. So now he's telling you who Jesus is. And then he goes into Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hisron. Hisron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab. Amenadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. I thought that was a fish. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. (sighs) Some of y'all are saying, you're going to read that whole thing? Let me, just for the sake of time and for the sake of your attention, let me have you skip to verse 17. Verse 17 says, Thus were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and then 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Three three different groups of people. 14 generations between Abraham and David. 14 generations between David and the exile. This is important. And 14 generations between the exile and the Messiah. They've been waiting. They've been waiting. They've been hoping. They've been looking. They've been thinking that the Messiah was going to come. And then it's verse 18 that gives to us the title for today's message. Are you ready? This is how. Somebody say this is how. This is how the birth of Jesus of the Messiah came about. He's just finished the genealogy. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Hold on a second. The first first part of that verse is where I want to focus. This is how. I need you to look at your neighbor and give them the title of today's message. This is how. Look at somebody else and say, this is how. You've been wondering how, this is how. You've been trying to figure things out, this is how. You've been needing answers, this is how. You've been trying to figure out when, this is how. Somebody say, this is how. All right, now keep that in your mind. And think about the context of what Matthew is writing. He starts out with this genealogy story. In the genealogy story, I wish I had more time to spin there. I don't, but let me just synopsize it for you in the genealogy story like I said you've got this introduction of Jesus to the world you've got this introduction of Christ to humanity but inside of this genealogy you have this brokenness but you also have Christ's divinity inside of this genealogy you have this brokenness but you also have the restorative quality of heaven that's being highlighted If we did an investigative study on the genealogy, we would find out that it's a pretty jacked up genealogy. Some of y'all are saying, oh man, what's he talking about, about Jesus' people? They were messed up. It was chaotic. Inside of this genealogy, if we had time, I could walk you through it. There were murderers, thieves, robbers, Some good, some bad, some kings, some prostitutes. All wrapped up in the genealogy of Christ. In fact, again, 14 generations, 42 in all between Abraham and Jesus, 14 between Abraham and David, 14 between David and the exile to Babylon, and then 14 from the exile back to the Messiah. Three sets of 14 Six sets of seven. I need seven volunteers. I did this spontaneously. I need adult volunteers here. Real, real fast. Come on. You've been voluntold. Connie, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Some people are not making eye contact. Y'all are like, I'm not doing it. Um, Come on up here. Y'all come on up here. Just start right here and just face the audience. Get right here. Face the audience. How many do I have? Somebody count for me got seven listen the first service 
and said, you've got seven. I turned around and had eight. <laughs> All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, ladies, what? All right, I don't want anyone offended. Oh, hey. I'm sorry, bud. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Gosh, no. Let me give him back his man card. Hang on a second. I'm sorry. Paul, I love you, man. I love you. You love me, Paul? I know you do, man. I love you, too. I just did that for entertainment's sake. I'm just saying. All right, now, I don't want anyone to get mad at me because of who you are in this, in this, in this experiment. This is kind of unique. I didn't plan this, but I want you to swap places with me, really, or with her. Thank you. Stand right here. Okay. Okay. You've got 42 generations of people here. I want you to imagine this is 42. It's actually only seven people, but seven people are going to represent 42 generations. Seven, the number seven. At the very beginning of this thing, we've got Abraham. At the very end of this thing, we've got Jesus. all of the generations in between. Now, if you were to really study, you would find out that you've got Abraham, who's the father of faith, who's the one, you know, who hears the message of God that your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. I'm going to bless your people. You'll be blessed in all that you do. And then you've got others on down the line that if we really begin to look at it, you've got, you've got prostitutes. That's so why I said up front, don't anyone get upset with me. <sighs> this is the only part of the story I don't like, okay? Or this illustration. Um, and, and you've, got, you've got Rahab, who's the prostitute. You, you've, you've got Solomon, who, who's got like thousands of wives, concubines. You've got Jehoram, who killed six brothers. You, you've got David, who was just a mess. And, and then you have... Jesus you got all of this chaos you've got all of this difficulty you got all of this stuff you got all of this junk you know sometimes anybody ever had a you know like you've heard of a background check you know what I'm saying sometimes we do our own background check and we look at our background and we say man it's messed up I'll never be out this will never happen I, you know my family was a generational curses all of these different things that happen in our background all of that was in the background of Jesus's life but it's like Matthew is saying this is how it all changed this is how in the chaos this is how when in the difficulty this is how when the problems were too big this is how when, when we couldn't figure things out this is how. Somebody say Jesus. When times were tough, this is how. When everybody made a mess of things, but this is how. When people just kept talking about others and you got this problem in your life and that problem and this difficulty and you'll never be. Oh, yes, you will because this is how. When you go to work tomorrow and you can't figure things out because you're so aggravated with the job that you have and it's not meeting your demands and your needs for the season. Oh, this is how. When you go home this afternoon and inside of your house you've got some turmoil and you're trying to get to peace, how do you get to peace? Oh, this is how. Right in the middle of all of the turmoil, Matthew is letting us know the chaos, the mess, the problems, the difficulties that had preceded Jesus and the times that were in culture at that moment that were so difficult this is how okay you're going to stay up here a little while is that alright I'm going to preach to y'all is that okay everybody alright okay then you got chapter 2 can I take you to chapter 2 Chris thank you man so smooth everybody say thank you Chris so chapter 2 then Matthew becomes very specific about the birth of Jesus. Inside of the birth story of Jesus, though, Ricky, there are some things that maybe you haven't looked at. Maybe your nativity set is going to get a little disrupted today. Because it says this, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem was also 
the prophetic word that came hundreds and hundreds of years before that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem and nothing good, they would say, ever came out of Bethlehem. It's not the place to be from. It's on the backwoods, if you will. It's on the wrong side of the tracks, if you will. And then it goes on to say, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? <laughs> we saw a star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Why? Because we see this story as three kings. First off, they were not kings. Secondly, it was not three people. It was a whole band of people. It was possibly hundreds of people who accompanied the Magi. And so the people in the community saw all of these people coming in, and they were a little disturbed it goes on to say, so when King Herod heard all of this and was disturbed, he called for the high priest and the chief priest and the teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And so they said, well, the Bible says, or God's word says, or prof prophecy says, in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search very carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report back to me so that I too may go and worship him. Somebody go, oh. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star that had they had seen when it rose, it went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. The introduction of Jesus to the world happens through a worship service. Could it be that worship is significant? Could it be that worship is what we were created for? And the reason why God is choosing to introduce Christ to humanity is so that he could draw out of us the reason why we were created? Oh, Lord, have mercy. This is how. It goes on to say, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming into the house. They saw the child, his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They then opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's some significance to those three gifts I don't have time to get into in this moment. But and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So inside of this narrative, you have really the, the plot. You have King Herod. You've got the Magi, you, you've, you've got Jesus, you, you've got all of the other nuances that are taking place here. You, you have the historical qualities, believe it or not, because this is Herod the Great. We know who Herod the Great is. We can research him by history, find out who he is, what he's done, all of those things. We understand now about the Magi. We understand what's going on here. So we see some geographical lessons here. We see some theological lessons here. But what Matthew is trying to show us is that this is the Messiah. This is the Messiah because he starts out with the genealogy because remember who he's writing to, the Jewish crowd. They've been waiting on the Messiah and the Messiah has to come through the line of David. He specifically references the line of David in the genealogy. This is the Messiah. Then he talks about how the Magi come to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is the place where Jesus is supposed to be born. There are 300 prophecies that are being fulfilled in this moment. It's as if Matthew is saying that here he is, here he is. He's the one. He's the Messiah. He's El Shaddai. He's the great I am. He's Elohim. He's, he's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He is the first. He's the last. He's the beginning. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
So he's introducing the greatest gift that God has ever given to humanity in Jesus Christ. This is how. But hang on a second. Can I teach? So you have, you have King Herod. King Herod is King Herod the Great. King Herod the Great loved power. He didn't want anybody else coming against his reign. He loved power so much that he would exact taxes upon people that was way too harsh for them to be able to even live under. He would impoverish the people so that they would be beholden to him. And then he would supply for their needs so that they had to come through him so that he looked so powerful. He didn't want anyone coming against his reign and therefore he killed 300 officers of the Sanhedrin court. Had them murdered. And then he didn't want anybody else coming against his reign and he thought that his sons were going to try to succeed him a little too early so he went ahead and killed them off. And then he heard his wife had a plot against him and so he killed her off. And then the Magi come in and they say, hey, we're here to worship the king of the Jews and you are not him. A lot happening here. So let me get, let me get, let me get four, four volunteers, four volunteers, four volunteers. Just one, two, um, uh, three, 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 three. Uh, Mike, come on. Mike, come on. Mike, what, making eye contact. So y'all come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up. Okay, so hold on a sec. Mike, you come over here. Mike, 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 you come over Y'all stay over there. Mike, Mike, you come over here. Mike, you're Herod. Sorry, brother, you're Herod, okay? You're Jesus just for the day. Y'all are, come on, come on over here, come on over here. Y'all are the Magi. We're gonna leave it as three because everybody sees it as three, but you need to go home and remove them from your nativity set because there's a whole bunch of people, you know what I'm saying? Um, or add more people to them. Go get some of those little figurines and put them in there with it. Okay, whatever. So what you have is you've got the Magi and you've got Herod. Herod's, you know, nobody can come against my reign. And now all of a sudden the Magi have traveled from far, far, far away. You've got the background of Jesus. Are y'all seeing this? I'm trying to set this visual illustration up. You've got the background of Jesus all the way from Abraham to Jesus himself. You've got the current situation that's playing out in Jesus' life in, in, in Herod. You've got the Magi who have come from afar. Now, I need you to understand something, which is really going to just mess some people up. When the Magi came, they didn't come the day that Jesus was born. In fact, most likely Jesus was 18 months old when they got there. Why? Because they came from someplace off far. At least historians believe as far as Babylon, which is a thousand miles away, they're walking with as many as a hundred plus people. Most theologians believe that it took somewhere between 12 months and 18 months for them to get there. Think about that for a second. So when they get there, Jesus is not a baby. Jesus is a toddler. Mm, hold on a second. I'm going to go one step further. They're coming to worship the Jesus, they are known as astronomers. They're not kings. That's another thing. They're not kings. They're astronomers. In fact, what they would do is they would travel around different regions. Kings would call for them because they, had, they were full of wisdom. And so they would go and sit in different courts with kings. And they would explain to kings what was happening in current times. They would explain to kings how to make the right decision with these circumstances that you've been handed. They, they, they've traveled for a long ways, thousands of miles. They've traveled for up to 18 months. They generally go around and they, they, they sit in these courts telling kings what to expect because they've been following Hebrew scriptures. They've been following it from Abraham. They know all the way through the genealogy here. Understand something. They are absolutely, when it comes to the Old Testament, they know it very, very well. Matthew starts out with the genealogy. Here they are after traveling 18 months. 18 months, they know what the history tells them. They know that the prophecies say that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. There's just a lot of stuff that's happening in the moment of the birth of Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy, all of the different stuff that's happening here. And they travel as far as 18 months. Can you imagine the sacrifice that it took for these people to chase after a star that would lead them to the Messiah, and the Messiah was just a baby. 
Can you imagine the sacrifice that it took? They didn't start out with a GPS. They didn't start out with all the coordinates. You need to just go on down a half mile and take a left onto Bragg Boulevard. They didn't start out. They didn't have those, those details. I, I wonder if they had had the details. I wonder if, if they would have went in the first place. I wonder if they would have been like, ah, oh, that's just too much. That's just too far. You're asking a lot. I wonder if... God gave us all of the details of our lives for the next 18 months or even 18 years if we would follow or if we would be like, oh, that's just a bit much. I don't know if I want to do that. It just seems like that's just a, a, a lot. You know, I, they didn't do this for a few days. They didn't do this for a few weeks. They didn't do this for a few months. They did this for 18 months. Can you imagine the sacrifice that it took for them to go just so that they could worship a toddler? Time out for a second. What kind of commitment is that? I just wonder, do we have that same kind of commitment in our faith today? Sometimes it can rain and kind of be chilly on a Sunday morning and people decide they won't stay home because it's raining. Woo, somebody say sacrifice. Or oh, I don't feel like going and serving today because that shirt that they want me to wear, I don't like the post that they want to put me in. I don't want to serve there today. I don't, I, I don't like that the shirt doesn't look really good with my skin tone. I wonder... They're willing to follow after a Christ that they have not met. Now, keep in mind, we're reading. We know the story in retrospect. We know the miracles. We know, we know everything. They don't know any of that, but they're wanting to chase after this Messiah. And so they travel some 18 months, and they get to this place, if you will, and I wrote something down this morning that, made me think about who we are as a culture. And I wrote this down. Sometimes to get more, because keep in mind, these guys are so wise and they want to travel around, you know, showing people their wisdom. So they're trying to really gain more wisdom or they're trying to show the wisdom. Sometimes to get more, and they're chasing after a Messiah, hold on, to get more, you have to be willing to grow. I need you to hear this. You have to be willing to grow more. If you want more, you have to be willing to grow more. And growth is a sacrifice. Growth is a sacrifice. Growth is a sacrifice. Why? Because growth follows hunger. Think about that. Growth follows hunger. You grow after you eat. You, you grow after you feed yourself. Growth follows hunger. It's a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice that the Magi were making in order to try to find Jesus. Growth is a sacrifice. Growth follows hunger. You see, you can't just be like, right, well, you know what? I'm going to just I'm gonna go to church this morning if I feel like it. <laughs> I'm not going to go to church today because I don't feel like it. I, I'm going to raise my hand today because, woo, I've got some joy, joy, joy way down in my heart. I'm not going to raise my hands today because I'm looking for joy. I'm going to serve because, oh, man, I feel good about serving and everything just seems to be convenient in my schedule. I'm not going to serve because it's not. I, I need you to think about the sacrifice that was present in the very first Christmas story. Then I began to think about what was, what was God doing? What was God doing in this story? You got, a, you got a messed up King Herod who's been killing everyone because he doesn't want anyone to come against his reign. You got a bunch of other Magi who are full of wisdom, traveling around to other places, telling people, showing people how wise they are, but yet now they're looking for a Messiah. 
you got a, a messed up genealogy from Abraham to Jesus. All of this chaos that is happening in this moment. People in the city are disturbed because they saw this big group come in and they're all like, what in the world is happening here? And I began to think, hold on a second. You, you, you've got in this story, you got Herod, you got the Magi, you got a messed up background, you got a Messiah who comes from a backwoods town called Bethlehem that nothing good has ever come from, who people despised, whose father was, whose earthly father was a carpenter by by trade what was Jesus doing Jesus was breaking down some barriers is what Jesus was doing I have to wonder if that's what Jesus is still trying to do today is to break down some barriers in our lives there's all kinds of chaos that's happening right here but he's breaking down the barriers of chaos all you have to do is just look around this body right here and you'll see a, a barriers that have been broken down you'll, you'll see a diverse crowd you'll see a young crowd you'll see an old crowd you'll see white people you'll see black people you'll see Hispanic people why because I believe God has called us to be the representation of Jesus Christ. I believe God has called us to be barrier breakers. I believe God has called us to serve one God with one mission, with one goal. I believe God has called us to lift others up when they're down, not beat them up when they don't look like us, act like us, smell like us. Good Lord, I'm, I'm about to start preaching up in this place. And so you had... You have this worship story that's happening here. This worship story that is introducing Christ to humanity. And then it hit me. Worship is not built on convenience. Worship is built around obedience. Amen. Did you hear me? Worship is not built on convenience. It's built around and on obedience. You see, so often we want to take Jesus with us. And Jesus is walking around with us. Or should I say, we should have or should be walking with Jesus. But instead, we want Jesus to walk with us. We should be listening to Jesus. But instead, we want Jesus to listen to us. We should be following Jesus. We're going down the steps. Jesus. But instead, we want Jesus to follow us. We should be asking Jesus for his plan. Instead, we're asking Jesus to bless our plan. We should be wanting the desires of the heart of God. Instead, we want the desires of our heart to be blessed by God. Let's go this way, Jesus. I didn't want to go back any further, Jesus, back that way. You see, I, I, I wonder, have we... Mm, this is going to be hard for some people. I, I, I wonder if we have written a gospel that we want to live by. Or a Christmas story that we want to live by. I wonder. You see, when you begin to follow Jesus and allow Jesus to lead you on the road every step of the way. Because of your obedience, you know what happens? Jesus, stand right here. You know what happens? Opportunity follows obedience. Obedience will lead you to opportunities. Listen, I need you to hear this. Obedience will lead you to opportunities. If right now some of you are saying, well, I haven't been seeing and feeling any of these opportunities, you know, that God has for me. Well, could it be that the reason why you're not seeing the opportunities that God has for you is because your lack of obedience will not lead you there? Could it be that the very thing that you're wanting from God, you haven't received the thing that God has for you because you're not chasing after the God who has the thing? Hmm. I, I, I wonder, listen, there is no one in the Bible, no one in the Bible, 
who received something unusual from heaven while doing something usual. We go to work and we want to just act usual. Listen, as Christ followers, we have, we, we have a purpose that God has placed with inside of us to be a light. When the boss does something that everybody on the job hates and everybody's complaining about it at the water cooler, are you right there with them complaining about it? Or, or is there something different about you? I, I, I just, I don't know why this is hitting a little different in this service than it did in the first service. But I, I just wonder, listen, I, I wonder if you realize that you will not have the unusual qualities of heaven in your life if you just do the usual things. And so here you have the Magi who are coming to find this Jesus and they have to go through this Herod and Herod wants to act like he's wanting to worship Jesus and the Magi have come to worship Jesus and then it hit me, what in the world? Time out for a second. Here are the supposedly the wisest people on the face of the earth who generally go to the courts of kings in order to give them and to bestow upon them their wisdom but yet they're chasing after who the one who is the answer. Oh my goodness, hold on a second. So they're chasing after the one who is the answer, even though they feel like their life is full of wisdom, they're chasing after the wisdom giver. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you're looking for an answer in your life, you won't find the answer in Facebook, but you may find the answer if you bury your face in his book. Oh Lord, have mercy. That's all I got to say. Listen, I'm just telling you right now, sometimes I think we're looking for something that we can't find in the place that we're looking for it in. Verse 11 says something. Verse 11 says something. Put, put verse 11 up. On coming to the house, I know what time it is, y'all. I'm about to close down. About to close down. About to close down. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, this is how. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his, with his mother, and they bowed down and worshiped him. With the context of everything that I just said, they bowed down and worshiped him. They bowed in front of a toddler. Some of you would say, well, they bowed because of the miracles. No, none of them had been performed. None of the miracles, none of the signs, none of the wonders had been performed. The only thing that had happened is Abraham begat, Isaac begat, David begat. Then came Jesus. So the Magi are coming to find the answer. Herod is trying to stop them. The Magi are coming to worship. Herod wants to be worshiped. Hold, hold, hold on a second. And Jesus is right in the middle of it all. This is how. This is how. You want to overcome the chaos in your life? This is how. You want to overcome the difficulties in your life? This is how. People are coming against you and you don't know what you're going to do? This is how. You got a whole bunch of junk in, 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 your, in, in your background? This is how. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to show y'all something. I'm going to show y'all something. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I want everybody to face that wall. Not y'all, just, just, just the genealogy crowd, all right? Everybody face that wall. Okay, hold on a second. So we started out right here with Abraham. No, not y'all. Y'all, okay. We got Abraham. Hold on a second. You got to face this wall too, Jesus. All right. You got Abraham all the way down to Jesus. Inside of this lineage is broken this chaos, a mess, murderers, thieves, prostitutes, problems, difficulties, all this. You got Herod, all the stuff that goes with that, that I just, you got, you got this. But you have this is how, right? Show up right in the middle of it. Hold on, because I don't think you're getting the visual that I'm trying to give you. In the background of Jesus, and in the present day of Jesus, 
is nothing but calamity, chaos, mess, and problems. Everybody that's in this line, now turn around and face this way. In the background of Jesus is all that stuff. But Jesus isn't living according to all of that stuff. Because when Jesus came, the game changed. And I don't have time. I know it's not a game, but the game of life. Okay, just hang with me for a second. But the game changed. What do I mean by that? I mean that up until that moment, Matthew's letting us know it's about your background. But when Jesus came along, it's about your bloodline. See, can I tell you something? Your bloodline will overcome your background. Your bloodline in the bloodline of Christ. Hold on a second. Then came Jesus. You're no longer Herod anymore. Then came Mike. You, you, you're no longer Hector anymore. No, just stay right there, Hector, because I won't mess up what y'all doing. Then came Hector. Then, 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 no, then came Matt. Uh, hey, Matt. Then came Richard. Then came, you, you put your name there. Listen, I don't know who this is for, but do not allow what's in your background to rob you of what God's placed. Because the bloodline of Christ. I, I, I need somebody to understand this. In all of that, all of that, all of what's happening in today's culture. This is how. This is how you are an overcomer. This is how you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. This is how when you need peace, this is how. When you are struggling, this is how. When you need hope, this is how. When everything is not going the way that you wanted it to go, this is how. In this season when you feel lonely, this is how. When things are not going the way you thought they would, when you look at your Christmas list, can I tell you something? This is how. Somebody needs to get up on your feet and realize that this season, oh Lord, have mercy this is how it's about Jesus Christ who overcame all of the stuff so that you may have life somebody say this is how